So um, our next speaker uh, is Jason Funterfeld. He's from Cork uh, and he's an emergency physician, a pre-hospital care physician. He's a vice chair of the pre-hospital emergency um, care society of uh, Ireland and he's the clinical lead for the Irish telemedicine service. Um, he's also an instructor on ATAC and has a wealth of experience both in education and clinical applications in the pre-hospital setting. Now I've been told that he's going to talk about oh, um, ventilation and cardiac arrest again. Uh, all right, well I'll hand you over to him then. Yeah, this, is, this one's for Ross. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to speak about some complexities of advanced respiratory care and I've got a few objections and objectives to go through and um, you know <laughs> how rude <laughs> oh, come on no no, no come on no, no. look um, a title slide like that's usually my cue to head out to the back grab a friend grab a questionable cup of coffee and uh, you know get here and look Hands up, guys, and be honest, right? How many of you are totally unmotivated to hear another conference talk about bloody cardiac arrest? <laughs> right? Thank you. <clears throat> Hands up if you absolutely cringe at even the thought of going on an advanced life support course. Keep those hands up if you are very little motivation or even interest in actually attending a cardiac arrest call. Now, my fellowship's in trauma and critical care, and this was my motivation, um, you know, prior to this process that I went through. It's decision time, guys. Blank slide. Scheme or presentation? If I was to drone on, even in a really animated way, about cardiac arrest, even in an excitable way, you'd rather be skiing, right? So, I would just cut to the chase and let you make up your own mind. Stay or go. Would you like to hear how your patient, in a refractory VF, could relatively reliably have observations like this. Enabling you to bridge your patient to definitive interventions such as ECMO. Fall off the stage again. In this case, a young man with refractory VF for 30 minutes to definitive interventions. Then stay and listen to my short Irish tale. This is an important picture for me because it was taken in the autumn of 2019, just before the pandemic. And at this time, this team had a ROSC on arrival to hospital rate hovering around 18% for all cause arrest. This is Team Rural Ireland. This is Team Rural National Average. Great people, great intentions. Now I'm going to talk about a little thing called Mel. Mel is a, is a word that is very old Irish. It, it, it describes how a rural community gathers together, comes together on a neighbor's farm to help save the hay or another crop, and each person would help their neighbor. They would in turn reciprocate, and they act as a team, and everybody benefits in some sort of way. And rural Ireland really comes together when someone is sick or injured. Since 2012, Irish bystander CPR rate has increased from 60 to 84%, the highest in Europe. 10% of defibrillation attempts happen pre-EMS arrival, the highest in Europe. And we have 10,000 voluntary community first responders at donations last year. Many thanks to people like Dave Menzies there in the audience. I can go on and on and on. The list of Irish achievements against best consensus international guidelines means that Team Ireland are the poster child for the resuscitation council. We do everything asked of us. And yet, our cardiac arrest outcomes are disappointingly average. And in fact, despite pouring our hearts and souls into achieving resuscitation council recommendation, Ireland's ROSC on arrival rate in the last 10 years has only increased by 1%. Do you guys know this already? CPR, even though exactly to the guidelines, the best available evidence doesn't do what it's intended to do. So what is CPR intended to do? Now, this is the chain of survival. We've seen this um, from the ECMO advocates. 
the success for resuscitation relying on two things. One is the optimization of the no-flow state, which is when nobody's pushing hard and fast in the chest, and then the optimization of the low-flow state. And you do this until you can deliver the patient to ECMO, PCI, or some other intervention which really gets the ball rolling and tries to get some sort of ROS. Now, we've been working on fully automated CPR in our service now for four years. We've reshifted our focus in cardiac arrest management with a firm focus on optimizing the low flow state to fully automated CPR, FACPR. So before I begin, can I just get a few things in perspective, just so we're on the same wavelength. Now, can we all agree that there's no silver bullet out there for treatment of cardiac arrest? We all know cardiac arrest, many hidden triggers, go well beyond a simple, erratic, easily defibrillatable piece of muscle. Every single human being is different. Every single patient is different. There can be no silver bullet in cardiac arrest. It's just not, it's just not a thing. It takes time to adequately explore and discover the underlying causes of an arrest. Being preoccupied with this physical, mentally demanding algorithm is arguably the worst use of this precious time. Accurate diagnosis, and listen guys, I haven't even come on to management yet, requires headspace, a bit of CRM tranquility. And do you all agree, though, that it's entirely beneficial look, and accepting that it's not always practical to adopt strategies that optimize this low flow state? And eCPR is the ultimate time machine. I'm a huge advocate, a huge fan of Lionel and Alice's work in Paris. However, there's a problem. Optimizing the low flow state or bridging a patient to eCPR remains a massive challenge to its implementation. I thought that was a rural island thing that I would have to get right before I brought eCPR into Ireland. But it's the first thing that's stressed on any ECMO course, no matter where you do. You have to optimize that low flow state. Fundamentally, CPR's role is to optimize end organ perfusion and oxygenation in the low flow state. Can we all agree and acknowledge that aspects of accepted practice, in other words, any intervention which interrupts CPR for any reasons are at odds with optimizing end organ perfusion and oxygenation. Fully automated CPR means we're going to have to automate the ventilation, but there's a problem. Why is automated ventilation just not a thing in, in CPR management? And if you look at the latest AHA guidelines published in November, it didn't even get a mention. It wasn't even a thing. It's simple because of all the research and ventilation during cardiac arrest to date has found that it's both inefficient and potentially harmful. Whether we pause to ventilate with a secured airway or unsecured airway, provide asynchronous ventilation, it just doesn't work. Okay, current ventilation strategies inflict uncontrollable airway pressures, reduce perfusion, and increasingly becoming aware of this thing, functional residual capacity. In fact, we now have good evidence, and there's lots of new papers in the last week even, showing that we don't even ventilate anything more than bronchioles. A question. What happens when you press the CPR button on a ventilator? Now, of course, there's differences between manufacturers, but principally, the ventilator provides synchronous breaths to a set trigger, which is guideline incentives, right? It deactivates the alarms. Why? Because it'll annoy us, it'll keep alarming because it's got these really kind of high pressures. And it deactivates the ventilatory trigger, obviously. Now, new devices, are they any better? Well, they just change the screen really, so that you can then do better CPR, get better feedback based on what? You've got it, guidelines. Now, I provide a critical care resource in a very large rural area, and exactly as Simon had alluded to earlier, even in the city, even with 292 brake horsepower, guideline compliant resuscitation with defibrillation takes place before I arrive. I am a critical care resource. I've got to bring something totally different to the scene. I've got to look beyond the guidelines. They've already not worked for this patient. They've already been ineffective in this patient's care. So I've got to start with clean slate thinking. And clean slate thinking to me is a placeholder. 
It's a disabled placeholder of fully automated CPR. A placeholder was you can figure out what has caused the arrest in the first place, and then once this picture becomes clearer, then I can manage the arrest. Find the diagnosis, look and see what's going on, decide where I'm going to move the patient. But this sort of thinking takes a bit of a leap of faith, and that's not easy. A faith that we haven't had before in the optimization or our ability to optimize the low flow state for all the right reasons. Now, I'm going to drop a, a pebble into your pond, and I do really do so in the hopes that the ripples generate robust discussion into the optimum way to ventilate during arrest. So let me explain CCSV. It's all in this slide. This is just a simple photograph of a patient monitor in cardiac arrest. So apart from them being in VF arrest with near normal oxygen saturations, blood pressure, and then entitled CO2, yeah, I know. Okay. The respiratory rate equals the chest compression rate, and it's synchronized with that SATS pro trace over there. Chest compression synchronized ventilation. Chest compressions generate a small, but they are detectable, tidal volume. During the downstroke of hands-only CPR, intrathoracic pressure is increased, that is propelled out of the heart, towards the lungs, the brain, the rest of the body. You guys know all this already. Gas is exhaled from the lungs as they get squashed. Downstroke equals exhalation which means the upstroke to recoil of the chest and negative thoracic pressure creates a vacuum effect, pulling blood back towards the heart, the lungs, etc. The upstroke is inhalation. Now these tidal volumes are small, they're below functional residual or closing capacity, and realistically they're only really ventilating bronchioles, so dead space. When the airway is secured and CCSP mode activated, the unique waveform generated by those small detectable um, ventilation flow sensors gets interpreted. It gets interpreted by clever software, and that signal directs the ventilator to produce a 205 millisecond breath in sync with that continuing downstroke of compression. So in plain English, CPR acts as its own synchronous inspiratory trigger. Chest, compression, synchronized ventilation. The intrathoracic pressure obviously becomes increasingly positive during the downstroke, greatly enhancing perfusion and the effects of the compression in terms of how the system is perfused. A true system, if you like. And because the intrathoracic pressure is at its greatest at the end of the compression stroke, when does the exhalation happen? Gas escapes during recoil, which is the opposite to conventional CPR. It enhances negative intrathoracic uh, pressure, pulls more blood back into the thorax, greatly improving coronary artery perfusion. A true diastole, if you like. So what? Well, remember we were team rural national average hovering around 18% ROSC on arrival to hospital rate for all-cause arrest? Then COVID-19 infection control measures mandated that we completely close the, the filter, uh, the circuit, and filter everything so that we're not aerosoling into the cab. We had to solve CPR aerosoling. That was our goal. And we had this ventilator already. We hadn't used CCSP before, so we gave it a try. I just needed to solve that aerosoling problem. And I was a very cautious early adopter. Uh, to be fair, I only wanted to solve that one problem. Uh, but by simply adding CCSV to Irish Pre-Hospital Emergency Care Council guidelines, doing nothing else, we increased our ROSC on arrival to hospital rate to 27% in a pandemic. Responding to cardiac arrests is messy. It's never perfect. I know, I responded to over 150 pre hospital arrests since I started fully automated CPR, and I could throw in another 25 in hospital arrests. But in all that imperfection, we were seeing some pretty unusually well perfused patients. They started to breathe back at us. Despite still being at rest, CPR induced consciousness, and it was not something we had to be ready for, not something that we just had to think about and have in our back pockets. And we were getting startlingly good non invasive blood pressures without adrenaline, I might add. We thought, wow, 
you might be onto something here. But you know, something was, something was not quite right. You see, our results were not reliable at this stage. Some patients' CCSV just worked. And in others, it was disappointingly average. But the one spark it did fire in me was respond to cardiac rest calls now became something I was interested in, a clinical challenge. They were now calls I wanted to go to again. But they were not for the chickens. We were starting to step outside the guidelines, and we had to be very careful that we weren't being too cocky about it. We started to appreciate that every patient responded differently, depending on what? Their pathology. In other words, what was wrong with the patient? Optimization of fully automated CPR started to become a thing. So we started to appreciate that patients got ROSC more reliably when flow patterns are both equally positive and equally negative. Tidal volumes, about a quarter of what you normally set, and end tidal CO2 coming out at about a third of what you normally produce. But how do we reach the state reliably? It was really odd, because it wasn't us, the critical care clever guys who got it. It was actually our BLS providers. They were really first early adopters at changing the way they do CPR to that screen. And they too realized that better curves meant pink patients and more ROSC. And our firefighters were resus gaming in a really positive way. You can hear them in the background here. They started doing far more than simply optimizing a CPR rate in accordance with the ventilatory rate. They, they altered the depth. They were altering recoil. They knew that if they did better recoil, they got better flows. They were, they, they were altering the force. They were altering, you know, they were even altering where they were pressing on the chest because they were giving live feedback. This was our biggest breakthrough. The next biggest breakthrough, because gaming aside, resource gaming aside, I'm convinced that human factors played the greatest role in our successes in 2021. With firefighters and the ventilator handling the pinking the patient up bit, the critical team was able to think. This was crucial. It was a definite CRM or crew resource management win. We had the headspace to do proper di diagnostics into rest like focus, or then make decisions, make those phone calls to activate things like the cath lab, or do some sort of other targeted pathology management. And our loss on arrival to hospital rates increased to 32%. Even our skeptics were really starting to take an interest. But they obviously started to ask for the Do you want to know the evidence? And to really look at what we're doing, we started downloading data from the ventilator. So this is the sort of typical beat-to-beat -beat or breath-to-breath -breath data that we have to retrospectively download. To put you in perspective, that's 30 seconds of fully automated CPR on that page. Peak air pressures, the flow, that 205 millisecond uh, breath with the downstroke, and that's the CO2 that's being produced from the patient. This is what synchronized chest compressions and ventilation looks like graphically. It became, you know what, it was really difficult to kind of properly articulate our approach. In other words, people ask you, what do you do? And it's really difficult to sort of say that until we start to map activity against timestamp ventilation data. In other words, what was the paramedics and doctors doing exactly at that time when the ventilator was doing something? And this example, while synchrony is maintained, what you see is, is, is kind of a, a, a variation of flow and pressures. This is hands-only compression running for about 60 seconds across the page. The compressor is human. Here, the flow is predominantly positive. This is not good. We're not achieving time volumes in. We're not achieving entire CO2. There's not enough gas escaping. Why? So to orientate you here, it's about three and a half minutes of CPR across the page. But what you'll notice is the peak is slowly falling and the flow is starting to trend upwards. This is simply down to fatigue and the paramedics start to rest in the chest and not adequately provide a recoil. There's our pause for rhythm check and fibrillation, putting on the mechanical CPR, not, I know, it's far too long. However, what ensued was fully automated CPR with vastly improved ventilatory and perfusion parameters. Our biggest concern when we started this really evolved around pressure. How much pressure were we putting into that chest? This is CCSV 
with a manual compression, a highly emotive manual compression. Why? Because it was a 12 kilogram child. Peak pressures and mean pressures, however, well within accepted parameters, despite that emotionalness of the arrest. I know exactly what pressure I'm putting into that little boy's chest. So when we got Ross, switched to IPPV, you can see very good pressures that flows throughout. But analyzing that flow and pressure, that presents a wonderful research opportunity and something which we haven't even looked at yet. Incidentally, by being aware, really, of uh, uh, able to download ventilatory data, we're able to compare what sort of different ventilation modes happen at, at the time in, in these really sick patients post-arrest. Um, incidentally, that's actually IPPV. In other words, what happens when you press the CPR button on the ventilator. And you can actually do this in pig studies, and, and, and you can look at how arterial pressure decreases as you switch from CCSV to IPPV. Um, intra arrest. So CCSV clearly is a thing that works on, 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 on fusion. In fact, it works so well, and using data to iteratively develop our technique, we were able to start to achieve a 39% loss on arrival to hospital rate in 2022 from all cause arrest. Then came 2023. 2023 was the year of compression. This last year has been the year of compression. There's evidence out there, obviously, that manual CPR is non-inferior to mechanical CPR. You know, traditionally, we slogged it up the mountain. But depending on circumstance, we don't actually rush to put in mechanical CPR. But mechanical CPR makes sense for our practice. It doesn't get tired. It's not subjected to human variation. You can provide heads-up CPR. You can get the patient out of the toilet, out down the hallway, down the stairs, out to the ambulance without any interruption. It's easy to intubate, but let's not forget, you can put really large lines in it far easier. It's a nice, stable platform. But mechanical CPR wasn't our missing link in Ireland. You see, Team Ireland, we have 53% usage of mechanical CPR. We have mechanical CPR advice in every single ambulance response car in Ireland. This wasn't our limiting factor. It wasn't our learning curve. But how we use mechanical CPR really was. By analyzing flows and pressures, again, this is two different waveforms, yeah, two different CPR devices, but uniquely this is on the same patient. We actually ran out of battery in one of the devices. Okay, so you can see that two different devices provide two different, totally different ventilatory flow patterns. Now, what's the relevance of this? We don't know yet, but something to think about. I'm not here to sell a particular mechanical CPR brand or anything like this, but ask, ask me this one question. How beast can your device reliably go? Incidentally, you see those ripples over there? That, that's fat. Fat is really difficult to, to manage, okay? And this is a 145 kilo patient. Flows and pressures we were able to maintain, we were able to get him ross. He's now a regular park run on Saturday. Most mechanical CPR devices, you cannot fit on something that big. Can you change the rate of your mechanical CPR device? What is the optimum rate of CPR? Is it the same for every patient? Of course not. The word optimum is actually quite silly. Humans come in all sh shapes and sizes. They have all sorts of disease processes. And in 2023, we started to actively tailor the CPR rate to our individual patients' observations, their non-invasive observations. How deep or how shallow should you be pressing? We found that plunger death is really important, and we actually change it as the patient starts to get better and better. And we actually alter it as part of that kind of algorithm when starting the full automated CPR. It's really important. Shallow and less forceful compressions are now becoming a thing because the ventilator is taking over a lot of that. Can you change your device's depth? Now Team Rural National Average is getting somewhere. 2023 saw our biggest uh, improvements in Ross and arrival to hospital rate. We're not done yet though. We're at 47%. I really want to get over that 50%. But what about 2024? Where's this year going? It's all about functional residual capacity. 
Well, we incorrectly think that chest compressions are simply squeezing the heart, when in reality we cannot ignore that we are compressing the whole thorax, in particular the lungs. And in doing so, through vigorous compressions, it can be demonstrated that we deform the lungs well below functional residual or closing capacity. In spiritual volumes, up to three liters are lost the minute that you rest. And then you make things progressively worse. You really started at a low flow state. You, you progressively eliminate more and more residual volume through high quality chest compressions, which in time leads to total lung or alveolar collapse. Think about it repeated compressions literally shut off all but the largest of bronchioles. Repeated lung compressions can also cause lung injury, especially when there's no air cushion there in the place. So, when a lung is fully collapsed, it simply will not expand efficiently without first resorting and restoring the functional residual capacity. And it actually takes quite a lot of pressure here in the peak. Oh my God, I just swore. A dirty word, positive end expiratory pressure. Um, it takes a lot of pressure to get that lung to the, that first inflated state or that just functional residual capacity restoration. And yes, we all acknowledge that excessively high pressures are associated with reduced perfusion. But what we rapidly appreciate is the converse is also true. There needs to be a physiological balance struck. We can't just simply be dead to anyone. So, with this knowledge, we now ensure that the lungs are inflated before we start CSC speed. In other words, we perform a recruitment maneuver first to optimize functional residual capacity before allowing the ventilator there to take over the management and monitoring of and control of intrinsic feed. And once optimized, we've alert, read the hard way, don't disconnect the circuit. I put it to you that CPR is simply a placeholder. It's not a treatment. It buys us time to get into headspace and figure out what's going on. I'm that confident in the perfusion provided by fully automated CPR with CCSV. When I arrive on scene, I, I suspend all further interventions, including defibrillation, heresy I know, until it is established and optimized. And then it's time to solve the problem, of course. Now, sometimes the route is really simple, pure carving bliss. You know, simple defibrillation of an arrhythmia, an immediate rasp, neurologically intact happy patient, maybe a bit of a sore chest. But you all know, conditions are always perfect. And the system I work for isn't perfect. None of your systems are perfect. You can be a wizard at resuscitation, but depending on you and your patient's current circumstance, that mountain you're climbing is simply impossible. You need to begin to regain bandwidth. You need to be able to find shelter in the storm, transport that patient. Now, I mentioned to you that our transport time is long, and I mean really long. I mean, we're talking hours in some cases. And we had a guy with a temperature of 27 degrees who arrested on us. It would take us 70 minutes to get to hospital, minimum. What do you do? So, we suspend all further treatments as per the guidelines, no adrenaline, no further shocking, okay? And we automate. Compare the skin color of a critical care paramedic with that of a patient. Just look how pink his arterial blood is. Now, incidentally, we don't shy away from endovascular monitoring when, when we're doing this, uh, where appropriate. But gaining vascular access, I tell you now, is so much simpler with fully automated CPR. I actually believe that fully automated CPR with CCSB is actually that platform that the endovascular techniques have been yearning for. So, your ECMO, your spear, Let's go and do it, guys. This is our profoundly hypothermic patient in transit. Nice and stable. Good flows, good tidal volumes, good end tidal CO2. This is a snapshot of, it, of, of, of the small volume, the, the control, the rapidly oscillating ventricular flows and, and pressures over the five minute period in transit. A CCSV is analogous to an oscillator, a well accepted ventricular modality. And as in oscillatory ventilation, tidal volumes and end tidal CO2 are low, but effective ventilation happens because of the small tidal volumes of 2 mil per kilo are multiplied by what? The chest compression rate. So small tidal volumes, high rate. And this multiplying effect is remarkably physiological. How physiological? Look at that. 
Here's his arterial blood gas. I took one hour, 40 minutes. Yes, one hour and 40 minutes after commencing fully automated CPR. He's still in arrest here. Look at the lactate, look at the potassium. He's obviously perfusing. Lactate level is nearly normal. Now, potassium is a big thing in arrest for us because if you're hypothermic arrest, if your potassium has gone off the scale, that, that's a good prognostic mark when you stop it. But it happened here. He was pretty damn good. He was ventilating and perfusing really, really well. So we had to go. And in our hospital, that means we contact our cardiothoracic surgeons and, and we, we, we ask them, have you got capacity to put this person on bypass on ECPR? Now, unfortunately, I had a heart on the table. They said, look, we'll, we'll bring another team in, take them to the anesthetic room. And so we did, with the automated CPR ongoing. He went into cardiopulmonary bypass three hours post arrest. And despite being in a non perfusing rhythm for over three hours, Having been bridged to ECMO with fully automated CPR and CCSV, he was successfully rewarmed and defibrillated. This gentleman was discharged to a psychiatric unit entirely neurologically and physically intact within a week. As you can appreciate, the, the team effort required to achieve this was immense, but very rewarding. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you fully automated CPR. With CCSV, ventilation, and cardiac arrest. Thank you. I'll pass you that back for uh, for questions. Right, questions. Ah, yep. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Um, A uh, question to you, or maybe to the partners in the back, I don't know. Um, is there an approach to link all the uh, involved devices um, and use all the available data on scene to improve uh, depth, um, frequency of compressions, it does. Metal volumes and stuff maybe on an... No, it machine? does already. And the intrinsic link isn't a, and this is the beauty of it, it's not some wide-up Bluetooth Gucci you know, technology which always fails, all right? It is simply the machine is detecting what you're doing, and then and you see it graphically. So if you're doing it well, you will see it going on the screen. So we do. That's what the firefighters are doing. They're gaming that screen. They're looking at those positive and negative flows. So we know when we get to that stage that, that we've optimized things. And we have non-invasive blood pressure, just normal non-invasive blood pressure, and normal SATs. It's all we need. You saw all those examples, SATs well into the 90s. Um, you already mentioned that you do get a lot of CPR-induced consciousness in these patients, naturally. So what's your concept for that? There's nothing you can't do with a good uh, neuroprotective anesthetic. <laughs> so that's all we do. Thank you for your story. Um, the ventilator mode, I hadn't heard of it, to be honest. Was it difficult to, or was it, how was the learning curve? Okay, so you saw the learning curve there, guys. It's four, it took me four years to figure it out, okay? We have, and, you know, in, in collaboration with the company that, that makes that ventilator, we are now thinking about how we train the trainer, okay? Because there is a definite learning curve. We had to step well out of the guidelines. If you just add it on, you saw 27% was our ROS grade. But to add it on and then change how we individualize, you know, CPR, resuscitative care for an individual patient, that's what took a time to figure out. So that's why none of this has been published yet, none of this is anything, right? We, we took time, but you see where we've got to. Thank you for the talk, Jason. Uh, about the transport times, I'm thinking of transferring your approach to like more city areas. Uh, what's your like shortest transport time for these type of patients? I mean, like it's, it's around the corner around the world for us. I mean, this is rural island. I mean, I've got some places where it takes me. I, I, I'll never, ever forget responding to a postpartum hemorrhage on blue lights, two hours, 20 minutes, and I was the first on scene. Um, you know, so like we have huge transport times, but then we also have cities like, like you have in, Stock in Stockholm. You know, so, so it's, it's um, 
But do, do, but the, do, the point do, is do, right, mm-hmm. the po- and, and and you know that Lionel Lamont makes this point really really clear. Why does he do ECMO in Paris? Because they're three stories up, tiny staircases. You can't talk about time from that point there to that point there. It's how long it takes to get that person out the bathroom, down the stairs, around that court, you know. And then that's not even taken into account that they might be supersized, you know. So it's really difficult to move people. Thank you. Question from me. So oh, yeah. the the rates of um, ROSC, has that been maintained post-pandemic? Because I was wondering, is there, is there a confounder in the pathology behind the arrests during the pandemic? Okay, so during pandemic, we only really got to 27%, then 32%, but we're now maintaining at just below 50%. I'm desperately trying to get over 50%, but it's, yeah. That's fantastic. That's absolutely amazing. Right. And, and the other thing is, uh, again, sort of looking at the international audience here, not all services can provide intubation uh, for, for cardiac Very good patients. Question. So what happens then? So in the early years, we were trying this as well. We were trying not to meddle too much. So our paramedic providers in Ireland all use King LTs, okay? So superglottic devices. So we try to not meddle. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the leak is it just makes it unreliable. So when I get there, I intubate do this okay it just it's, it's far more reliable so it's mandated that you have to intubate them to put on that mode or if you if you if you yes okay it is mandated but guys are we all <laughs> mandate guideline followers here yay of course Nay. all right <laughs> but end of the day we've tried it it doesn't work as well okay it really doesn't intubation yeah fantastic thank you so much an amazing talk